Good morning and welcome to another edition of the National Newspaper Publicist Association's Let It Be Known. Again, we are live outside of Jacksonville, Florida for the Players' Championship in rainy Florida, really, which the rain has interrupted the first round play, but it's still a big week. Tomorrow, PGA Tour Commissioner Jay Monahan will entertain the Black Press of America in the hallowed halls of the PGA uh, Sawgrass's beautiful clubhouse. It is a sight to see. And while African-Americans haven't typically been associated with, with, a, with the game a lot, the Players' Championship down here is something everyone should experience. This has been a particularly special experience as this week, young talent connects with legends as we have spoken with HBCU students uh, here whom the PGA Tour has extended great opportunities to, as well as young individuals of color whom the First Tee program has helped millions hone whatever craft they desire and incorporate the game and business of golf. We, all, we were also on hand for the Hall of Fame induction of Tiger Woods, who was enshrined with an amazing and an emotional introduction from his 14-year-old daughter, Sam. So despite the weather, and believe me, nothing, and I mean nothing, can sour you against this most magnificent piece of property here at TPC Sawgrass. It's been an amazing week for golf and for the National Newspaper Publicists Association as we observe the 195th anniversary of the Black Press of America. This morning, Let It Be Known correspondent James Wright will lead what promises to be a riveting and insightful discussion about the relationship between the Black and Jewish communities. But first, let's bring on James and uh, Sam Collins of the Washington Informer as we discuss headlines to start your Friday morning. James and Sam, it's always a pleasure to see you guys. Good, Good morning. 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 James, Sam, um, real quick, Black Panther director Ryan Coogler was detained by police in Atlanta after going into a bank attempting to withdraw $12,000 from his account to pay an employee. Wearing a mask and dark shades, Coogler wrote a note to the teller on the back of his deposit slip asking her to be discreet when handing him the money. However, the pregnant teller reported to the manager that she felt uncomfortable and also that a warning alarm on Coogler's account further exacerbated her misgivings. Police detained the director who asked them to Google his name and that they'd understand that he was no bank robber. Bank of America and the police have apologized and Cougar said he was satisfied with the bank's apology and the discussion that took place after. Let it be known we'll have much more on this situation and those like that in the days to come. Also in the news this morning, the American basketball star who was arrested in Russia on allegations of drug smuggling was detained on February 17th, according to a U.S. congressman who uh, provided the most detailed public account yet of how long Brittany Griner has been in custody. And U.S. efforts to get Griner out of Russia are complicated by strained relations between the two countries, a deterioration exacerbated by Russia's war with Ukraine. U.S. Rep. Colin Allred told ESPN uh, yesterday that I do think that it's really unusual that we've not been granted access to her from our embassy and our consular services. We will keep an eye on that situation as well. Uh, we are hoping for the best for Brittany Griner. We don't know all the details. Everyone is still trying to ascertain the details, but it would be great to get her home. Well, this morning, it's all about the relationship between the Black and Jewish communities. James Wright has been bringing uh, information constantly to let it be known's attention. And finally, uh, James, it's on you. We thank you for this opportunity to, to kind of peer into that relationship. So James, take it away. Thank you, Stacy, And thank you for this great opportunity to talk about the relationship between a historically strong alliance that seems to maybe have gone awry uh, in a little bit of time. When I was in the eighth grade at Pierce Junior High School, my English teacher introduced us to a six-week course on the Holocaust. One of the books that we read was the diary of Anne Frank, uh, who had to hide with her family and friends for almost two years, I believe, in an attic in order to, be, to avoid being captured by the Nazis. And also we watched the, uh, the Holocaust which at that time was really a riveting uh, series about the horrible in, um, the horrible uh, things that took place with the Jews and uh, the Jew six million as we know six million Jews were killed in Europe at that particular time by the Nazis. 
And um, since that time, I've had a, an affinity for the Jewish people and their plight. And uh, I was just appalled that this took place because uh, Europe is supposed to be so sophisticated. But hey, as an African-American, I understand um, state-sanctioned terror and those sort of things. So when Whoopi Goldberg talked about um, the Holocaust was about race, uh, many people got very upset. Many Black people defended her, whereas many uh, Jews did not. And so this is what we're going to start our discussion with in terms of Whoopi Goldberg. Uh, I will be joined today by my colleague at the Washington Informer, Sam Collins, uh, Yolanda Savage Nara, the uh, a director at the Uniform for uh, Union for Reform Judaism, uh, DC Council Member Alyssa Silverman, and someone who I've known a very long time, uh, an effective activist and a scholar, uh, Dr. Shelley Tompkin, Professor Emerita at Trinity University here in DC. Let's start this off with Sam. Sam, what do you think about what Whoopi Goldberg said? Sam. Okay. Uh, it seems like we're having some technical. I think that sure, about about Black Jew relations. Hmm. Can you hear me? You, we're having. We can hear you now. Uh, I think that ABC squandered a good opportunity for a discussion between Whoopi Goldberg and her colleagues about Black Jew relations and about what she meant by her comment. Uh, when it comes to what she said about the Holocaust not being about race, she looked at it from a prism of the American racial system mm -hmm. and from what I can see, the global racial system, which is based on phenotype. And oftentimes when we're talking about uh, Judaism, um, we often look at Judaism as it being only relegated to people who have white skin. When in fact, when you're talking about Judaism, we forget about people such as those living in Ethiopia and parts of Africa who also practice that spiritual system. So what Whoopi Goldberg said, even though it's in order for us to speak about what she meant and to speak about black Jew relations in a higher regard because there are people within the African-American community who look at what people of the Jewish faith, Europeans of the Jewish faith have been able to accomplish over the last, over the last half century or so. And they look at that in comparison to what African-Americans have endured and they see some, um, a lack of, a lack of equality in that sense, a lack of equity. And oftentimes, where African Americans engage in discussion when it concerns people of the Jewish faith, Europeans of the Jewish faith, instead of us having dialogue, there's often um, accusations of anti Semitism. Anti Semitism that often gets accusations that get conflated with genuine concerns about the power dynamics between Europeans of the Jewish faith and African Americans in this country. So, ABC, once again, like I said before I stop, they squandered a good opportunity to have a thought provoking discussion. And that's part of the reason why we see such a schism. It all comes down to the power dynamics between Europeans of the Jewish faith and African Americans. She Shelley, uh, would you like to weigh in, please? Yes, I. I completely agree uh, with what was just said. And um, I would say that I think the, the pushback that occurred um, uh, was necessary uh, to clarify some of what was just said, um, because uh, even though um, it's easy in our context here in this country um, to compare the Jewish experience where Jews do not get profiled in the same way that African-Americans do. In, in the context of the World War II and the Holocaust and the Nazis, they defined Jews as a separate inferior race 
And that led to the extermination of 6 million Jews. So it was, in a, it was important to discuss, um, but it's also understandable uh, that um, Whoopi Goldberg in the American context might have viewed it initially differently. But I think the important thing is that after there was input and feedback, um, she acknowledged that it was both race and man's inhumanity to man. She apologized um, and uh, for causing any hurt to anyone. And therefore, um, I thought that it was wrong, very wrong, to suspend her from the view for two weeks. So I, I, I agree with the comments that were made. Thank you, Shelley. Dr. Chavis is here. I'm going to bring him on after we get through with the council member. Well, he's here right now. Um, I want to bring him on after the council member and after uh, Savage Nara. Council member, you're from Baltimore and you went to school with African-Americans. I'm just curious, what are your thoughts about what Whoopi Goldberg said? Well, good morning to you, James. Thanks for getting me up bright and early. Uh, I <laughs> Here's my take on it. You know, I am disturbed by the swift, like, condemnation and shaming of Goldberg. Um, you know, if her words were said in a hateful way, then I think I think words of hate should always be condemned. But what Goldberg was saying is that as a black woman, and you know, I. I'm, I'm not, you know, she certainly has a, a last name that many Jewish people have, and I, I'm not sure if she identifies, self-identifies as, as Jewish. Um, but, you know, I, I have to say I was disturbed by the fact that there was this, like, shaming of her. Um, you know, do I have a different point of view than she does? Yes. Um, you know, in that Nazi white su supremacy, and I think this was said by maybe one of her colleagues on the show, uh, you know, was um, sort of the reigning belief of the Nazis, um, you know, that encapsulated the extermination of more than just Jews. Um, you know, I, I so I, I'm not a big viewer of The View, but I, I have to say, you know, I agree with Sam and Shelley, that I think there is an opportunity to have discussion and dialogue. And beyond Goldberg's comments, I got to tell you, uh, James, that this kind of like swift shaming for different points of view is an extremely disturbing um, characteristic in, you know, I have to say in our city. You know, we in order to talk about difficult issues, black Jewish relations, race, uh, gender issues, you got to have difficult conversations where people don't have they don't have perfect points of view and they have different points of view from their lived experiences. And we have to be in a pluralistic society. That's what's great about a plural, pluralistic society. Sorry, a little earlier for me, um, in that people have different lived experiences and they bring that to the table. And that means they're going to have different points of view. Um, so, you know, I don't think she should have been, I think the opportunity to talk about, well, what really happened in Nazi Germany? What was, um, you know, there's an, I think your story, I'll end it here, James, about being exposed in your early years to what happened uh, in Nazi Germany and your understanding from Anne Frank's point of view as a 12 year old girl about what was going on to her family and her world at that point, it gave you empathy for her and for the Jewish experience. Uh, and that's what we need to do more of. Thank you very much, Council Member. Uh, Yolanda, uh, what are we as African Americans not getting? And you can say, you know, whatever you want, but what are we not getting about uh, this Whoopi Goldberg controversy? Your thoughts? Thank you, James. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with this um, phenomenal panel. I would say that we are, um, we're, we're complex. We are not a monolith. And it's really important for us to step back and look at 
um, issues like this on a case by case basis. And the entire culture has turned into a cancel culture. I talk about this a lot. Um, this idea of a compassion culture is really what we need to, to foster. And I think in the case of, of Whoopi Goldberg, um, her, her lens was based on the systemic racism and, and how things play out in the United States context. And um, Nazi Germany um, did actually use the Jim Crow laws um, to inform um, how the Nuremberg laws would be created and to focus um, on creating a separate race um, in Germany um, based on um, the way Jim Crow has done that. And so I think it's an opportunity that we need to um, continue to hone in on and have these conversations and dialogue so people can actually understand the history of this country and global history as well. And until we are able to really do that, we will continue to have this divide because immediately this culture canceled Whoopi. And a lot of that was based on racism and sexism. And so we have to take a look at all of those things and how they intersect. Thank you very much, uh, Yolanda. I'd like to bring in Dr. Chavis. Uh, the president and CEO of the NNPA, uh, just to say a few words. Uh, hello, Dr. Chavis, how are you today? Thank you. I'm about to catch a plane to join Stacy in Jacksonville, Florida, but I do want to weigh in on this. I want to thank all of our panelists and guests. Uh, from the NNPA perspective, we value, and, and I would say um, embrace strengthening the relationship between Blacks and Jews in America. Just this past weekend, I marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge again at the 57th anniversary of the Voting Rights March. And you know who I marched with? The daughter of Rabbi Herschel. Uh, and um, at one point, there was another rabbi that was carrying the Torah. I carried the Torah across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Why? It was symbolic. But the truth of the matter is, uh, in the Civil Rights Movement, in the height of the Civil Rights Movement, some of our strongest allies were brothers and sisters from the Jewish community. And of course, uh, because of the history of uh, white supremacy and racism in America, it's been an attempt to divide uh, blacks and Jews. But I think it's in our common interest uh, to work together. Uh, there are a lot of Holocaust deniers out there. There are a lot of um, uh, racism deniers out there. And so I think that this is a healthy discussion. And I think what Wilbur Goldberg did uh, was an opportunity for ABC and all the networks to have this discussion. And I'm glad that the uh, black press, as we celebrate our 195th anniversary this year, that we're not afraid to have this dialogue. I think it's a needed dialogue. But after the dialogue is the question, what do we do together? How can we work together? And how can we improve the quality of life of our communities in which we serve? Thank you so much, Dr. Chavis. Always, always wise, wise words. And uh, giving it to Dr. Chavis's generation, some of the problems started with the Baki decision in 1978, which basically outlawed racial quotas um, in uh, public and some private institutions. And then you had the 1984 Jesse Jackson campaign where Reverend Jackson made a very derogatory off the record remark uh, to a reporter uh, characterizing New York City in a particular manner. And then, you know, then we had the rise of uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan. And so, Shelley, you were very active during that time. Uh, could you talk about how things were between Blacks and Jews at that particular time? Yeah, I would like to uh, address first the, uh, the Baki case, um, because I think there were uh, organizations in the Jewish community um, that uh, wrote legal briefs opposing uh, rigid um, quotas. Mm -hmm. And that was because in the 1920s, 1930s, 40s, and then um, less so in the 1960s, quota systems were used to exclude um, members of the Jewish community in various institutions of higher learning and uh, corporations, it was used as an exclusionary device. Right. Um, and so 
when the Baki case came along, which was a, a, a quota of a set asides for 16 spots in the medical school at the University of California um, for persons of color, um, there was a concern that this would negatively impact Jews and that, again, they would be excluded because of the quota system. So that, I think, was behind it. But three things should be noted about this. Um, number one, there were Jewish groups, the National Council of Jewish Women, for example, who argued strongly um, in favor of the, the, the strict quotas, the strict mm. quotas, um, arguing that that was a very different um, device because it wasn't meant to exclude, it was meant to include and that it was necessary because of structural racism, it was necessary um, to, to bring more African-Americans and persons of color into the medical profession. Um, uh, so there were Jewish organizations that argued that. Um, the second point I want to make is that the, the Baki decision that came out of the case uh, did, did not abolish um, all race conscious programs. It was a middle ground decision. Um, it uh, came from Justice Lewis Powell's concurring opinion that race could be used as one consideration among others in college admissions um, to promote diversity in the classroom. So at the time, it was a middle ground decision. It didn't please people, as I recall, on either end of the spectrum, but uh, it, it um, maintained um, affirmative action programs. They could have been abolished completely in that decision. And the third point, which is very important and I think is not as well known, is that in later decisions in the Grutter uh, versus Bollinger and Gratz versus mm -hmm. Bollinger and later on in 2013 and Fisher versus Texas, yeah. Jewish organizations, the same ones who had um, written the briefs in Baki had switched. They really had switched their their positions um, and uh, had had uh, weighed in in favor of the race conscious affirmative action programs. Um, and why did that happen? A few hypotheses. One, uh, the Jewish community was not as threatened as it was in previous years that uh, they would be excluded or they couldn't compete. Um, secondly, the, the uh, admissions program at the University of Michigan included, it, it gave 20 extra points in, a, in 150 points for admission for persons of color, um, um, Native Americans, African Americans, and Hispanics, but that wasn't the only factor. There were other factors. So it, it went along with the, the Baki decision. And um, I, I would also say that by that time, you know, the Jewish community was um, generally, not, nothing is monolithic, um, identified with, with, you know, liberal uh, positions on many of these issues. And that affirmative action position was a little bit of an outlier. So all of those factors, I think, weighed in in the change. It's interesting. Thank you for that very comprehensive uh, discussion about um, the Baki decision. And I've even learned a few things from you just a few minutes ago, Shelley. Thank you so much. Uh, Sam, just quickly weigh in on, Baki's way before your time, but could you just quickly weigh in in terms of what Baki meant to you at that, just quickly weigh in. Um, what it means to me is that, you know, in terms of, um, issues related to uh, integration and African-Americans being able to attend institutions, it speaks to the fact that any policy that is good for African-Americans is good for uh, Americans of different racial and ethnic backgrounds. And oftentimes when people, um, regardless of who they are, when they, when they, when they fight against or they, or, or they, or, or, or they are against legislation, that is of interest of certain historically oppressed groups. They misunderstand what it means for the greater populace and what it means for uh, actualizing um, what America was supposed to be on paper. You know, so in terms of the Baki decision, I think that 
was what it was from my perspective, you know, uh, especially given the fact that, you know, of course, showing my age here, I wasn't around for that time, but at the very same time, you know, as for as long as Afri Africans have been in this country, everything that has been related to our liberation has been connected to the liberation of others. And I think that's a constant theme that we need to really uphold and discuss and keep in the forefront of our mind. Thank you, Sam. Uh, council member, you're a politician. Um, could you talk about um, racial quotas in terms of, uh, you know, politics? So, you know, we know quotas are not allowed in politics, but you, you understand the general gist, gist of what I'm saying, asking. Well, here, here's my take on this, um, James. You mentioned that I grew up uh, in Baltimore and I went to public schools there. And honestly, I at, in high school, I was the only Jewish kid in my class, white Jewish kid. And, and uh, studies show that socioeconomically diverse classrooms are higher performing. They are. We need to make sure that we have opportunity um, but different points of view, because we're enriched by different lived experiences. You were enriched by uh, your teacher's perspective and the things that you read that were different. You know, certainly Anne Frank had a different lived experience than you had in Austin. Um, and, you know, I was in a classroom with kid with black, not just in, and this is Baltimore in the eighties. So it wasn't just black mm -hmm. kids. It was white working class kids, you know, whose parents lost their jobs in the deindustrialization. They, they, the auto mm -hmm. plant wasn't there anymore. Domino sugar wasn't it, you know, a, a, mm. a poor mixed spice had moved out of the city. And, you know, these were kids dealing with different things than uh, my family dealt with because my dad was a federal worker who took the train to D.C. every day. Yeah. Um, we benefit from that. I think Sam just said that. You know, I think that with the Baki, I think, but we can't ignore what is like the difficult thing to deal with when we're talking about racial quotas. And I'll just bring it down to a very D.C. level. You know, it's like, we all have different lived experiences and race is certainly a big part of that. Um, but I think in education studies, you know, the issue is like, if you have a black student at Sidwell Friends who has, you know, parents who are professionals and, and you know, should we consider give a preference to that student more than their person sitting next to him who could be their next door neighbor who's white? Um, you know, because certainly a black student at Sidwell probably has a different lived experience than a, a black student at Baloo. But on the other hand, that student's still black. Um, and I think those are kind of the difficult things. Again, going back to our first discussion, we need to talk, wrestle with and talk about. Um, and we just don't do enough of that in this city, in this country. That's my big theme today. We need to have more discussions like you're doing, James. So kudos to you. Thank you very much, council member. Thank you so much. And, uh, Yolanda, um, could you just talk a little bit about, uh, what, we, uh, this particular topic? Um, I'm sure you have a very interesting perspective on this. Unmute. Yes. So I, I was um, young, very young when um, the Baki decision happened. And so it's something that I learned about, um, you know, much later as an adult. And I will preface this with um, me being um, raised in Mississippi. And so I know that there are um, a lot of issues there that um, specifically in the 60s and then, you know, during the civil rights movement um, apply to, of course, um, black citizens in the South, but also included Jews and and Jew and Jews from European heritage who were in the South. And so when you move into the late 70s, there's still remnants of some of these things that are happening. And that's what makes the Baki decision very complex. It's a very individual specific 
um, decision that happened. And um, Baki said, why am I being excluded? So there's this question of inclusion and exclusion. Um, the, the quota system is something that had to happen because of the structural and systemic racism that Black Americans have experienced for, for years and still experience today. And um, there is a way that sometimes that excludes people, especially people who have been excluded in the past. And so I think when we think about things, we have to think about the both ands. A lot of things are not just black and white or either or, they're both and. And it's important for us to, to embrace that nuance and think about um, how things impact individuals as well as the collective society. And so that's that's where we are and not to take it back to Whoopi Goldberg's comments, but I think that, you know, that we have to seize these moments and opportunities to really have these conversations that are challenging and uncomfortable at times, but will move us in the direction that we that we need to go. Thank you very much, Yolanda. <clears throat> We're um coming down to uh, as they say in horse racing, the finish line. Uh, I would I would like for the um, guests to give a thirty second response. Please keep it to thirty seconds. Uh, thirty second response to Trumpism. Uh, can blacks and Jews work together in terms of Trumpism? Uh, we'll start this time with the politician Alyssa. Council member. Hmm. Hi, James. Are you? Oh, okay. Am I here? Yeah. 30 seconds. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, I'll make it short. Yes, we need to work together because Trump is a hateful, divisive figure and <laughs> does who does classic scapegoating and that he's telling one group of people, your problems are not because of you or because of our economy or structural issues in our society, but because of these other people who look different than you. And, you know, we've seen this time and again in history and we have to stop it. Hate, you know, the common bond between, uh, you know, the black and Jewish community and there, and there are many people, including on this program who are in both those communities, um, is hate in that we need to fight commonly against hate and um and you know that is our that is our biggest common enemy uh, <clears throat> uh shelly you are a political science professor 30 seconds on blacks and jews and uh trumpism i i think that we need absolutely need to work together uh and how do we do that to combat trumpism uh, number one, self-examination, examine our own uh, prejudices and, and uh, perceptions of the world. Number two, uh, joining together in groups to just like this wonderful program today to listen to one another and to become educated. Number three, to uh, work together on common goals, um, dealing with racial economic disparities, um, combating um, voter suppression, these kinds of common goals. And finally, finally, joint messaging um, to when you have these incidents, uh, Whoopi Goldberg statements by this person or that person, where the groups that have bonded and have relationships between African Americans and Jews, um, that they raise their voices um, with, um, messages uh, to combat the hateful messages. I think that's very important. James, I'm gonna jump in and, to, and just real quick, wanna go to Yolanda. Um, uh, Yolanda, what is the mission of Reform Judaism and what work do they do and why is this important to the relationship between the black and Jewish communities? Awesome, thank you for that question. So Reform Judaism is about justice and equity and um, welcoming everyone um, who wants to be a part of um, the community into the tent. And it's really focused on making the connection um, between our brothers and sisters and humanity, our brothers and sisters and everyone, um, however you identify um, as a, a part of the family and really um, uplifting the value 
values um, that are very basic and foundational to the human connection um, that we all have. And it's important for us to understand that, um, that, that that's who we are. We are human beings at the end of the day. Um, Reform um, Judaism actually um, covers about 2 million people in the United States. We have 850 congregations, 2,000 clergy, rabbis, and cantors. And so um, we have a wide reach across North America, and we work um, very closely in coalition with our partners to focus on um, all kinds of social justice and racial justice issues. And at the core of, um, of Reform Judaism, that's who we are. And it is a very important part of um, how we do our work um, to make the world a better place. Awesome. Well, you know, this is what the National Newspaper Publicist Association does. This program in particular is called Let It Be Known. And we love these discussions. James Wright, we really, really appreciate you uh, for bringing this to Let It Be Known. We have many, many journalists in the National Newspaper Family, National Newspaper Publishers Association family. We invite all of them to bring topics the way James Wright of the Washington Informer and our uh, one of our favorite correspondents has uh, brought to us this morning. We thank you all for continuing to watch and support us. Watch us on YouTube. Uh, check us out there. We, we encourage that. Uh, and we encourage you to continue to tune in each morning to start your day with the Black Press of America. This is 195 years of the Black Press. We wish to plead our own cause. For too long, others have spoken for us. Everybody have a great weekend, and we will see you Monday.